Um, just to briefly again go over Rano's show, Laura and I will do a little housekeeping, a little introduction. And then Joanna, who's also on the screen, is running the back end of the Zoom. So if you have, if you encounter any tech issues, please um, chat with her directly. Um, and uh, your names are listed in alphabetical order according to last name in the chat. That'll be the order you guys get called in. You'll have five minutes. I'll have my iPhone. The timer will go off. You'll hear the ring. That's your indication to wrap it up. Uh, when you guys are all done with your presentations, we will open the floor to anyone who wants a five minute slot. So there's no crosstalk, no questions. Um, they'll be given slots and we they'll have the same timer thing and we'll go until uh, 11 on the west, uh, two in the east, and then we'll bring it home and wrap it up. And um, I just wanna thank you guys all so much for um, being here. And then also just so you know, Kelly Morgan actually can't join us, but she wrote something uh, and Laura will read Kelly's statement in her uh, absence. And I still, mm, I still don't see Coco in the waiting room. Do you? I get in, but she says she's in the waiting room and I don't see her there. I don't see her in the waiting room. She's texting me. Yeah, I think a text just flew by me as well. Um, I mean, worst comes to worst, we can pluck her out right of the meet. I mean, we can just call on her once we see her in the meeting. I think I'll just, well, I'll just let everyone in the meeting in a minute and she should be in there. Okay, I'm just gonna go get my phone for the timer. These are always the awkward moments when we're waiting for everything to start. <laughs> that moment when you're throwing a party and you're like, no one's coming. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, she needs to be a co-host. Coco needs to be let in, but I don't know. Does anyone have the password for <laughs> Sorry, this is like... The link is working, but she needs the password to be let in. The link is working, but she needs the password. Okay, let me see. I didn't use a password. I just, just sent it to Laura. Okay. You did? Oh, awesome, Joanna, thank you. Via uh, chat or? Via chat, yes. And I'm sorry, I'm distracted. I'm, I'm keeping my eye on the waiting room to see if she's um, gotten in. Sending it to her right now. Because if you know Coco, like we can't. Oh no, she's like. Can't not have Coco. I mean, like it's not even, you I know. Just, I just put the meeting ID and passcode in the uh, chat. I just sent her the passcode. Oh. Hopefully. So we'll let her in. And then I need to make her a co host because she needs to share her screen. Um, can you guys allow us, the panelists, to unmute ourselves? I don't know, but I'm I'm looking at Joanna on the screen to see if she knows how to do that. But we're on we're work on it, Pablo. Oh, I think I. Thanks. It's just I I muted myself and then I realized I could not unmute myself. <laughs> uh, welcome to neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and for those of you who I don't know, who uh, uh, have agreed to do this, I, I commend you for your extra little bit of um, bravery. I'm very, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, pleased. I'm sweating. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Are you setting like a timer after five minutes or what, what will be the noise that we should expect if we go? It'll be like, it's my iPhone. So it's the, you know, little, the international iPhone alarm ring. Um, 
and you'll hear it and then you'll kind of know. And if, if it gets too long, I'll, I'll like kind of gently lean in and say something like, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, I, I'm thinking very quickly and I've gotten it under five, so. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I won't, I won't, I won't let, um, any of our egos get the best of us uh, this morning. We'll save that for another day. Um, Why isn't this working for Coco? I don't know. What to I say. don't know because the waiting room is piled up with folks. And so- and You can also send an invitation to Coco um, in the participant link. If you're a host, you can invite somebody. So you can send her an invitation via email. Yeah, just send her a new link. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, can so Steve, are you unmuted or no? Okay, Joanna, I wonder if maybe okay, there we go. There we go. Thank there you. we go. Okay, beautiful. And still, I do not see Coco in the waiting room. God damn it. <clears throat> All right, um, Laura, what do you think? It's 9.02, shall we? Um... I'm just talking to Coco. Uh, okay. Um, sorry. Thanks you guys for bearing with us here. What's behind you on your wall, Greg? Oh, it's uh, mock-ups for uh, uh, of poems that I was scaling up for a museum exhibition. I'm in my studio, as are some of you, or all of you. No, it's just me and Helen. It's like dumb Gen Xers trying to figure this out. <laughs> um, Laura, if I send Coco details, will she recognize my email? Okay. I have her Gmail account. But... Do it and then we'll tell we'll flag it for her. Okay. Try again. I know. I don't know what to say. Um, okay, hold on a second. Why don't you why don't you restart and try again log out of Zoom and log back in again and then I'm Because I don't know either because everybody else was able to log in. I don't understand. Did she register and all that jazz? Yeah, she. I saw her on the registration list. Laura registered her and I saw her there this morning. It's really weird. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You Joanna, can you eat? Can you just ask one more thing? We'll do that. We'll be just. Sorry? Oh, well, we haven't let anyone in yet. In a minute. Okay. All right. Laura, I think Coco might be in the waiting room and we're not even seeing her as a name right now because Susan just said that she's in the waiting room. There she is. I just saw her. Wait, 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 wait. We got it. We're in. Okay. We're in. We're in. Yay. We're in. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm making you co host. Okay. There. Oh, yay. Yay. Okay. I was like, oh my God, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> like we're going to make this thing work. Okay. All right. All right. Coco, so, just down and dirty because the waiting room is now filled with people. Laura and I are going to do a little intro. 
You're I have my to... talk. I have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, we're only going to give you five minutes. I'm I know it's a, it's five slides and it's on a it's on a loop. All right, this um, is five minutes. Let's make you a co-host. Have we done, done that? Done. Okay. All right. Um, Coco, your name's in the chat. We're doing alphabetical order by last name. When That's you fine. guys are done, we'll open the floor to everyone else. They'll get five minute slots. We're done at 11 and or two. And I think we should uh, try and do this. Let's do it. I'm gonna- right. Are you opening the waiting room? I'm opening it. <clears throat> hey. I yeah. got a meeting in the ladies room. I'll be back real soon. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for being here with us. Who are all these people with all this time on their hands? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've heard, Coco, but there's a global pandemic. I know, but I've never been more overtaxed with like assignments and writing and webinars and could you please comment on how you feel right now? Are you worried about dying right now? <laughs> it's true. We're all worried about fucking everything right now is all I but Everyone has uh, you know, nice apartments. This is great. <laughs> I'm getting like mad decorating tips. Look at all the art in Paul Haas house. Jesus Christ. I love it. I love it. You're seeing my bedroom with my son's eagle. He made that. It was a oh, that's impressive. Oh boy, oh boy. All right, hello art world. Hello art world. Welcome so much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are, gosh, we're, this is overwhelming. Um, for, for anyone, um, we still, uh, uh, we're letting people in to the waiting room. So folks are still funneling in. Um, if, there is uh, uh, tech glitches. Um, we blame them on Donald Trump uh, <laughs> as a matter of course. Yeah. And if, um, if you can't get in or you get knocked out, we are also live streaming this on YouTube. Uh, so we, and both Laura and I put the link to the live stream YouTube on our IG posts last night so if there's any if if you if you fall out of the 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 loop in some way there is a way uh back in um, and i'm putting that link in the chat right now so if you end up wanting and, and also that link for youtube will have um <clears throat> will give you access to closed captioning in case you would like that um yeah so um the YouTube chat is up there. Okay, great. Um, and just so you know, on the tech front, we've got um, Joanna Rachinska wonderfully joining us. There's Joanna. She's helping to moderate the chat. So um, if you have questions, you can always ask Joanna. Um, and also if you would, so just to say, this is how we're gonna run this thing. Um, Helen and I are gonna do a little intro. We're gonna talk a little bit about what um, drove us to do this insane thing. And then um, Helen's gonna lay out the, the kind of facts as we have gathered them as, uh, as best as we can see. <laughs> um, and then we have a group of wonderful people who are going to speak for up to five minutes each. Um, and they will be speaking in alphabetical order. Um, they'll be Greg Bordowitz, Nikki Columbus, Allison Ferris, Coco Fusco, Charles Gaines, Pablo Helguera, Steve Locke, Kelly Morgan, although Kelly couldn't be here because she's teaching right now. So I will be reading Terry Carol, Kelly's statement. Um, Chelsea Spangerman and Terrence Washington. And if you would like to take to speak after that, please just drop your name in the chat and say, I want to speak or let me talk or just put your name <laughs> and Joanna will add you to the queue. Um, we'll keep going and we'll put oh. as many people up as possible in the two hours that we have and then kind of take it from there. Um, Helen is going to be our timekeeper and she has her trusty phone that will 
do a little ringy dingy at five minutes and then you know it's kind of time's up um we just want to keep it flowing and we're really seeing this um you know as a way for us to kind of have a giant ball of ideas. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's really about kind of Helen and I really both feeling the need to have this conversation, missing the casual ways in which we would see each other and wanting to recreate that somehow in this strange mm -hmm. yet weirdly intimate setting of Zoom. So I don't know, Helen, maybe you should talk a little bit about why you wanted to have this conversation particularly. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first off, welcome everyone. And um, I am um, I am currently speaking to you guys all from unceded Tongva land in uh, what we now call the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, the Tongva people have been here since before um, colonial settlers arrived and they continue to live here and steward the land. Um, really uh, in the name of all of us for which I am profoundly grateful. Uh, as Laura indicated, one of the things that I miss the most is seeing people in interstitial ways. I never thought I liked gallery openings and now I miss them because I miss the little five, 10 minute encounters where you get to hear from people that maybe you know and really like friendly with, right? Um, and I found that I'm in an echo chamber of my closest friends and I'm missing the this more um, this <laughs> community that I feel we are um, provisionally and intermittently parts of and I want to see what the intelligence of all of us might be able to bear, bring to bear on this subject. I also confess uh, with all due respect to our colleagues in the art press uh, the internet does not appear to be a forum uh, producing um, thoughtful work at the moment, thoughtful debate. And so maybe this is another place and it's sort of, um, you know, I'm an 80s, 90s kid. So I was thinking about those old Dia talks where everybody would kind of pile in and listen to people. And then there was a lot of conversation. So hopefully that will, that's the form, the formal reason for this forum, the content reasons is that I realized I had bit, way more questions about the Augustine event than I had answers. Um, I'll just offer three of my questions as ways of showing perhaps how I am constitutionally ambivalent. I'm always of two minds on just about everything. Um, but I was really curious about in this moment how white people can work on issues of whiteness and white supremacy. <laughs> Uh, like a crucial thing to try and figure out how to do. And might I ask that everyone mute themselves, please, just so that um, any ambient noise in your life doesn't become ambient noise for all of us. Thank you. Um, the other thing I was, I'm curious about, um, and all of my questions I realize have to do with institutions, not Gustin. So that's also an issue, right? We have a Gustin issue and we have an institution issue. Um, my second set of questions revolved around um, the incredible need of our institutions to diversify their staff at all levels of institutional hierarchy, but how once we do the work of diversification, which is long overdue, um, how do we not essentialize the presumed identities of the people that hire? How do we make sure that um, statements like we need a black curator to limit what that black curator can do? Assume the curator will come in and perform acts of critical race theory on every exhibition, right? How do we make sure we're not essentializing people's identities, which is a way of limiting their own curiosities and interests? So I have. I have real questions in that front. And then finally, um, I have real questions about um, this culture of retaliation and anonymity that we are currently insisting in. How do we... Mm -hmm. 
gone. Is she gone? We just lost Helen, but we're trying to get her back. I think I'm back. Am I back? You're back. Yes, you're back. Right. Awesome, you guys. Um, so there's a culture of anonymous statements in the internet right now of complaint. And we're told that these statements cannot be um, named for fear of retaliation. And then we had one of the curators involved in the Gustin affair speak publicly. And it does seem like there was some retaliation and he was suspended. Um, how can we ensure that the people who work in museums can speak publicly, critically about their institutions without fear of reprisal? So um, those are the kinds of questions I was interested in. And I realized I didn't have fulsome answers to those questions. So Laura, how about you? You're muted. I also had a lot of questions um, and I think we kind of bonded over that. Um, and my first instinct on reading about the postponement was like, yes, the institution is slowing down. One of the things in my research that I've been doing for the last couple of years around this new book that's coming out next spring on uh, museums and art in an age of protest um, was really kind of aimed at looking at institutional problematics and the way that we resolve them or at least attempt to undo them. Um, and slowing down is really one of the big things that I think has to happen just unequivocally. And so my very first response was like, oh my God, they're actually gonna slow down for a minute. I mean, I didn't think four years needed to be a thing, but you know, that's, so at first I was very pleased that there was this kind of attitude of, okay, we have to confront certain things that we haven't, that we acknowledge we haven't dealt with. Uh, like when Kaywin Feldman talked about the kind of whiteness of the institution of the NGA and the whiteness of the team um, that had put the exhibition together. So there's that. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, this is a lot of resources being leveraged. Um, and, um, you know, to make this show happen, to make this show happen. And, you know, are there other, you know, why Gustin, basically? I love Gustin. I know a lot of people who love Gustin. I know that there's a lot that the work says to me about our current moment. Um, but just, you know, as I was really ambivalent about that, or I still am. Um, and so there have been Gustin shows before, there probably will be again. Anyway, I, I do think there are things that are really important about this work right now, but there are also so many other artists whose work remains to be deeply explored. Um, and then, you know, and so those were kind of my bigger picture institutional questions, which I think have to be tethered to the content of the work. And I think we can't kind of separate, you know, what we put in the room or the gallery from how the institution works. And that both of these things are implicated and conditional upon each other is a really important aspect of where I think cultural spaces need to go in terms of how they think about undoing and redoing. Um, and I started to think about um, a moment in the um, Racial Imaginary Institute event that the Whitney held uh, following the, um, the, the controversy about Dana Schutz's um, open casket painting. And there's a woman at the end, a black woman at the end who I don't know who she is, but if anybody can tell me who she is, <laughs> I would be most grateful. She talked about um, making work from the position of the perpetrator um, or not, sorry, not making work from the position of the perpetrator. She talked about rather than depicting the victim of a heinous crime, what about depicting the perpetrator? And um, she didn't say it that way. She said it much more eloquently than I just did. Um, but I think that, um, you know, one of the things about Gustin is that there's this kind of really intense piece about these hooded figures that he paints because 
he as a white man is relating in some way to or trying to understand the relationship to the perpetrator, uh, the hooded figure, the difference and the shame. Um, so anyway, I think those are the reasons that I wanted to enter this conversation. And, um, and I have so many questions more, but I'll leave it at that. And um, so now I'm going to hand it back to Helen, because she's going to um, give a review of the situation as far as it's been reported. And, you know, we've checked this with the curators for accuracy. So we hope we're not perpetrating you know, future confusion, but we believe this is correct. And we're certain that this whole process is flawed in many ways. Um, but I want to just offer this as our kind of, you know, experiment and thank you for being with us on the road. All right, so here, uh, here is a sort of statement of the events and facts um, as um, uninflected as, uh, as possible. And as Laura said, we shared this statement with um, the four curators of the exhibition to make sure that we hadn't got anything wrong. Okay, so as many of you know, <clears throat> pardon me, this past September, the directors of the National Gallery of Art, the Tate Modern, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston announced that their collaboratively organized traveling retrospective of Philip Gustin would be postponed for four years from its original opening date of 2020. Um, that the, the show would open in 2024 and that the postponement was due to the social unrest in the wake of the police murders of several black citizens in the United States. The press release issued by all four institutions collectively stated the following, and I quote, we are postponing the exhibition until a time at which we think that the powerful message of social and racial justice that is at the center of Philip Gustin's work can be more clearly interpreted. We recognize that the world we live in is very different from the one in which we first began to collaborate on this project five years ago. The racial justice movement that started in the US and radiated to countries around the world, in addition to the challenges of a global health crisis, have led us to pause. As museum directors, we have a responsibility to meet the very real urgencies of the moment. We feel it is necessary to reframe our programming and in this case, step back and bring in additional perspectives and voices to shape how we present Gustin's work to our public. That process will take time, close quote. In a subsequent interview, the National Gallery of Arts director, Kaywin Feldman said the following, and I quote, I would stress that I am absolutely committed to doing this exhibition and I believe in Philip Gustin. I'm not sure that I would argue that the public needs a white artist to explain racism to them right now. That combined with a meager track record that the National Gallery has of showing and engaging artists of color makes it difficult for one of our first major exhibitions about racism is from a white perspective, close quote. Further, Kaywin added, or I should say Ms. Feldwin added, quote, I am convinced that we can't do this show without having an African-American curator as part of the project. It is not about the artist, it's about us, close quote. And I think it's worth noting here that the catalog included texts from all four of the curators uh, and as well as by 10 contemporary artists, two of whom are African-American. Feldman's position was supported by a forceful ethical voice in the art world, Darren Walker, the leader of the funding powerhouse, the Ford Foundation. Mr. Walker said, quote, what those who criticize this decision do not understand is that in the past few months in the context of the US has that the, excuse me, that the past few months, the context in the US has fundamentally and profoundly changed on issues of incendiary and toxic racist imagery in art, regardless of the virtue or intention of the artist who created it, close quote. In the immediate wake of the postponement, Tate curator Mark Godfrey, one of the four curators of the exhibition, including Harry Cooper of the National Gallery, 
Allison DeLima Green of the MFA Houston, and Kate Nesson of the MFA Boston, Godfrey stated the following on his personal IG account, quote, canceling or delaying the exhibition is probably motivated by the wish to be sensitive to the imagined reactions to partic of particular viewers who are assumed not to be able to appreciate the nuance and politics of Gustin's works. By canceling or delaying, a message is sent out to the that the institutions get Gustin's clan paintings, but do not trust their audiences, close quote. On September 30th, an open letter circulated via the online platform of the Brooklyn Rail and called for the restoration of the exhibition. The online letter stated in part, quote, rarely has there been a better illustration of white culpability than in these powerful men and women's apparent feeling of powerlessness to explain to their public the true power of an artist's work, its capacity to prompt its viewers and the artist too, to troubling reflection and self-examination. But the people who run our great institutions do not want trouble, they fear controversy. This letter was signed by thousands of artists and art world professionals, and I feel I should say here in the sake of transparency, I signed this letter myself. On October 28th, the art newspaper reported that curator Mark Godfrey had been suspended from the tape for speaking critically about the institution publicly. On November 5th, the four museums issued a press release stating that the exhibition would now only be postponed for two years and would open at the MFA Boston in May, 2022. The decision to accelerate the opening date was described as follows by MFA Boston director, Matthew Teitelbaum. And here I'm quoting Teitelbaum, quote, my most recent discussions have underlined the need to move the exhibition to an earlier starting date than we first anticipated when we announced our postponement. We listened to what was being said. Museums must be a part of the conversations in our communities about the ways in which art allows us to consider difference and identity, even if those discussions are difficult or challenging. And then finally, in Artnet News, Sarah Coscone reported further about the MA, MFA Boston's plan specifically. And please note this, the, what I read you next only refers to the MFA as now the opening institution. Quote, and this is Cascone. The revised exhibition will incorporate reflections from more contemporary artists on what these historic works mean to them. Historians and other experts will speak about Gustin's KKK paintings in video clips. Visitors too will be invited to share their reactions. The institutions have not yet decided if any black curators will be joining the exhibition's currently all white curatorial team. But Teitelbaum, director of the MFA Boston said that there will be quote, and this is Coscone citing Teitelbaum, more diverse voices contributing to the preparation of the historical framing materials that allow us to appreciate the context in which Gustin worked and achieved his vision, close quote. So that is where we are. That's our understanding of the situation um, from uh, the people who are closest uh, to it. And I think, Laura, um, I, this might be the moment where we really press play. Um, as you know, some folks we invited, some folks volunteered for these first five minute sessions to seed our, to begin. There, we will call them off in alphabetical order. If anyone on the Zoom, and we hope that many of you will uh, volunteer, would like a five minute speaking position after these folks talk, please put your name in the chat. Joanna will list those names numerically so you can be aware that your name is coming up when called and you can prepare your thoughts. And I will um, set a timer and at five minutes you'll hear it ring. and we will move forward. And also as you um, come up, uh, if you can just say your name and just sort of your general affiliation, artist, curator, whatever. Um, and, um, and finally, um, make sure you unmute yourself um, and you don't have to speak for the full five minutes. So we'll hand it over to Greg. Claire. Thank you both. Um, 
Thank you for inviting me to speak. I am here mostly to listen and I do not have an answer to any conundrum raised by the postponement of the Gustin exhibition or what we can call this Gustin situation. We find ourselves in a situation that exceeds the appreciation, appraisal, or assessment of Philip Gustin's work. The situation is multifaceted. In approaching today's topic, I am reminded of Michel Foucault's repressive hypothesis. The explosion of discussion around a particular area of topics is actually the way contestations of power differentials are played out. What is represented or pointed to as the topic is also composed of what is not said about the topic, the topic itself and any assertions that we are not addressing regarding the topic directly or indirectly, all are constituting features of relations among people regarding the topic. Lastly, by having this very discussion, the participants, including myself, unavoidably participate in the very disciplinary structures and institutions that are at the center of the subject. I find myself in a dream here, feeling all the positions, museum board members, administrators, curators, artists, viewers, publics, paintings, and even the dead artist whose name we append to this situation. I recall Sigmund Freud's understanding of the dream work. As the Gustin situation is a contested arena and the very imaginary that we are together co-creating at this very moment, in the analysis of dreams, reality is so close to dreams. The same physiological operations that produce perception are strikingly close to the same physical mechanics of hallucination. In the analysis of dreams, the dreamer is every figure and every object contained in the dream, not just one figure, no single object. Even the most terrifying or despised, even the most terrifying or despised sentiment embodied in the dream symbol is a part of the dreamer. The dreamer is the totality of the dream. Disgust or rejection of something in the dream is a split off aspect of the dreamer's psyche. The beloved object is part of the ego of the dreamer. All is the id. How are the repressive hypothesis and the dream work both relevant to this forum? The situation itself begs for analysis and perhaps this analysis escapes my comprehension or cannot be contained by one opinion. As I said before, I find myself in a dream here, feeling all the positions, museum board members, administrators, curators, artists, viewers, publics, paintings, and even the dead artist whose name we append to this situation. I suspect that by considering the, the Gustin situation, here we face nothing less than the defining contours of reality, or rather the shape of realities and the relations among relations that combine into a worldview. What's at stake here is the collapse, perhaps welcome, of one worldview the defeat of a dom dominant worldview, the unachievable consensus of a worldview. The postmodernists exhorted us to avoid totalizations. We are now living the reality of totalization's impossibility. Unlike many postmodernists of 20, 30, 50 years ago, I do not believe that the impossibility of a unifying agreement to one worldview necessarily indicates a fall of civilization, nor does it necessarily indicate the collapse of empire or capitalism. I am not that sanguine. It is not possible for this contributor to experience the dissonance of our situation as the music of a future dawning. Now that I've pulled back the lens to its most distant position, the greatest focal length with the weakest optical power, there is nothing left for me to offer except a question. What about this situation commands such attention that it is worth gazing upon when the whole Gustin episode is merely a symptom and not a cause? Thank you.
Nikki Columbus, please. Nikki? Be on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Laura and Helen, for this invitation. Um, I'm honored to, as I'm saying, I'm so honored to speak with such an incredible group of people. Uh, so I think I was invited because I wrote a polemic about the Gustin Brouhaha for N plus uh, one, because I was fed up with the histrionic response. There are bigger issues at museums right now. So I'm not gonna repeat my text here. You can find it online if you're interested. Today, I wanna make three points. One, let's stop talking about Gustin. Now, the people who signed the Brooklyn Rail letter might not have expected it to suck all the air out of the room, but that's what's happened and we're letting it happen again right now. I think most of us can agree that the central issue here isn't Gustin, it's structural racism. And yet we're all gathered here today to talk about a show that was postponed. Why? After everything that's happened at museums since March? Let's at least take a step back and talk about how to reinvent the model of the monographic exhibition, especially of a canonical white male artist. Or, you know, let's compare this with the, the cancellation of Sean Leonardo's exhibition at Mocha Cleveland earlier this year. I don't remember any open letters in Sean's defense. But his response isn't the pity party we're seeing with Gustin. He's using this moment to talk more broadly about the representation of black and brown trauma. But this still keeps the focus on museum exhibitions and on museum directors and curators and artists. So two, let's start talking about race, class and precarity. Somehow, whenever we talk about museums, the majority of employees, the black and brown museum workers magically disappear. Where did the art world get this mythic idea that the best way museums can fight structural racism is with exhibitions? I mean, come on, the whiteness of the museum extends way beyond its gallery walls. You fight structural racism through structural change. We shouldn't need the delay of a major dead artist's third retrospective to suddenly start talking about white supremacy at museums. Where was all this indignation in March when BIPOC museum workers were being fired and furloughed in droves? Did you think it was fine when MoMA cut all of its freelance educators and said they wouldn't rehire them for months, if not years? Where was the support in June when art workers began addressing open letters to museum administrators demanding anti-racist and decolonizing action, including at the museums presenting the Gustin show? Or in August, after the new museum union filed a formal complaint against the new museum for the retaliatory firing of union members. Or let's cast our minds back before COVID when art workers were demanding salary transparency and paid internships. Every one of these should have catalyzed widespread high profile support and media attention. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying that the people who signed the letter, the people here aren't doing other, cr other critical work. Many are, and I hope you'll talk about that today. But the mainstream discourse on museums is a senior level discourse. It's conservative, it's elite and privileged. Now, yesterday there was a meeting about a new union that's being organized. On Tuesday, there was a webinar for an audience of college students on the future of museums, in which speakers talked about paying a living wage so that museum jobs are open to those who aren't economically privileged. Every week, there's at least one public forum on these issues, often organized by POC art workers. Entry and mid-level workers and artists are way ahead of their seniors in talking about these issues, and the latter needs to take note. So three, let's take action and leverage our power. A lot of open letters are written and signed by art workers who have a great deal of moral authority, but little power to actually effect change. But that's not true of the Gustin letter, which makes it all the more shocking, disappointing that this Tony group had just one meaningless demand. Show Gustin now. We really need to be more ambitious. Just yesterday, the Philadelphia Museum of, of Art, which is now closed until the end of the year, announced that all staff who can't work from home will be furloughed. Think about who those workers are. These are the workers in security, facilities, visitor services, who've been working inside the museum all these months, the lowest paid workers taking the greatest risks, and they'll have no salary for the next six weeks. We should write a letter, but more than that, we should act. Artists. Have you been invited to show at the PMA next year or one of these other museums? Refuse until they pay their workers. 
Are historians, have you been asked to write for a catalog, take part in a public event? Sorry, can't do it until you recognize your union. We can exert tremendous pressure when we act collectively and withhold our labor. If you have a senior position at a museum, you can stand up for lower paid workers, publicly demand that the museum's budget match your values and support unionization. This is what we need to talk about in public. The PMA, MoMA, the new museum, LA MOCA, museums don't want to change, but if you have a reputation to leverage, you can make them change. It worked with Candors. There's a lot we need to fight for right now and it can feel overwhelming, but let's start somewhere. Will you do that? I'm asking everyone here, will you do that? And if not, what are we doing here? Thank you, Nikki. Next up, Charles Gaines. Charles, if you'll please unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, you can hear me okay. So, um, Charles Gaines. Uh, if, they, if I go too long, just turn my, just mute me. That's all, that's, I'm fine with that. But the, uh, the four postponements uh, made by museums have been guilty of advancing exhibition strategies based on white privilege in the past. So now showing the same ignorance that had made them historically insensitive to these matters. The postponements of the Gustin show in order to, as they say, provide a more balanced voice weaponizes their privilege by inventing a population of people who they think are, they are protecting, but they don't have a clue as to who this population is in reality, since they are responding to an ideological fantasy of, fantasy of their own creation. It's the same fantasy world they created that helped them uh, from recognizing their privilege for centuries. I find it offensive that they have, by this action, reduced a highly sophisticated critique of institutional racism and privilege to a dogma, and using this dogma to show the world that they are indeed sensitive to social issues. This action is a function of reducing critique to dogma, not by an imagined horde of black people calling for censorship. The critique of white supremacy is a complex one that cannot be reduced to dogma. Dogma presupposes an audience that is emotionally tied to a subject, not critically engaged. It has no investment in critical interrogation because it's dogma or philosophy. That is the conclusion pre-exists the proposition. In this case, the museums are not interested in a critical interrogation. They presuppose that black people would be offended. But the first problem is that these boards who are almost exclusively white would make this decision without first questioning the body of black art professionals about it. Maybe as a first step, they should have found out the complexity of thought that black people in reality hold. They were not comfortable in seeking the opinions of their curators because uh, they're all white. I understand that the staff, the guards in particular were questioned in a couple of uh, institutions. They may have had problems with the Klan paintings, but you don't question such a limited group to determine whether an exhibition should be mounted. In no other case has this been done. The museums were concerned that their whiteness would be a problem in mounting a show that included Klan paintings but they failed to understand that they were asserting their whiteness when they postponed the show. So their whiteness is still a problem. A case in point is that among the institutions that were criticized for the postponement, the Tate Modern not only postponed it, but also suspended Mark Godfrey, uh, their chief curator, and the only one on staff perhaps in the entire museum who is knowledgeable about art's relationship to race because he was publicly criticized, uh, because he publicly criticized the decision. When asked about this at a board meeting, my source said that the members were told that he was taking a vacation. When questioned about the truthfulness of this, the chair of the board uh, brought the discussion to a close by muting the microphone of the Tate's only black board member. Another illustration that the museums are indeed protecting their privilege, the director of the National Gallery said they postponed the show because it was disrespectful to its audience. Again, what audience? They selectively thought, uh, sought out opinions from some blacks uh, but ignored and silenced the opinion of a critical mass of blacks who was actually art professionals. In addition, there is a general belief that showing uh, sensitivity means to hire a black curator to participate. Uh, this is tokenism taken to its limit because the curator should have been on staff before all of this happened. In addition, these hires are usually given no real power and authority, but serve only to make the, the boards comfortable. This is why I argue that the audience the director speaks of is actually a fiction of, of their own making, a phenomenon that is the natural consequence of decisions made by boards that lack diversity. Most speak about the issues of censorship, the failure of museums to carry out its mission, et cetera, problems like these as being responsible for the problem. But, I, but as I said, the problem goes much deeper. Museums which are dedicated to selecting and protecting objects that represent the highest examples of taste and thought are not 
equipped to make the complex decisions needed to address social problems because they, by virtue of their mission, they remain, remain white supremacist institutions, liberally minded, but white nonetheless. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Allison Ferris, would you please unmute yourself, Allison? Hold on, let me, maybe Joanna can unmute you from, um, uh, there, you there you go. I'm good, great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Laura and Helen for organizing this event and for giving me the opportunity to speak. A discussion of the postponement of the Gustin exhibition is not complete unless we also consider the suspension of curator Mark Godfrey at the Tate, one of the curators of the Gustin show. Godfrey, as most of us know, was suspended for publicly disagreeing with the decision to postpone the exhibition. Then again, I told myself at least the Tate had only suspended Godfrey. If he worked at an art museum in the United States, more precisely, if he was a female curator working at an art museum in the United States, my guess is that he would have been, after signing an NDA, promptly walked out of the building by security. The postponement of the Gustin exhibition and the suspension of Godfrey are the latest examples symptoms really, of a crisis of leadership that lies squarely on the shoulders of museum directors. They are our museum directors failing us. They're failing because they're not looking in the mirror and saying to themselves with urgency, fear, and horror, I am leading a white supremacist institution. What the hell am I gonna do about this? Instead, they're scurrying around trying to put band-aids on recurring cracks, breaks, and fractures in the system of the institution. Remember Freud's theory about the return of the, re of the repressed? Autocratic leadership styles are really popular now in museums on the part of directors. So is a deeper adoption of corporate culture while simultaneously blocking the organization of unions and right now I wanna just uh, shout out a, um, a support to the employees of the Portland Museum of Art in, uh, in Maine, my state. Um, they are organizing a union despite being actively discouraged by their director. Read all about it in the Portland Press Herald. Um, I also worry that directors are scapegoating their curators for the problematic institutional culture that they, the directors, created and maintain. And I'm, I'm worried that this might become a trend. Promises on the part of directors to commit to the work of DEAI ring a little hollow given these circumstances. And where does this leave members of the museum staff, the art museum staff? Silenced, right? In an article in the art newspaper last week, Robert Storr was quoted as, staying, as saying, regarding the suspension of Godfrey, museums are forums where people come together to discuss ideas and to agree and disagree. If Tate can't even do this internally, then the whole thing breaks down. I absolutely agree with Storr, but that comment shockingly sounded quaint to me. Store, as we know, has been ensconced in academia for the last 15 years. Most museum staff members are afraid to speak, even though, yes, in theory, museums should be a forum where people come together to agree and disagree. But Lord help you if you do, which is why we now see a plethora of social media sites where museum staff communicate anonymously. So my question to all of you is, do we write a letter to AAMD? You know, that elite organization of 200 or so directors that, well, worked so well recently with the Baltimore Museum of Art to deaccession three works by white male artists from their collection so they could acquire more works by women and artists of, col of color. If you don't know about that, check it out. Um, do we tell that organization that they are, as a membership, embarrassing themselves? that they, it's just not looking good for them. 
I mean, they admit that they make mistakes, these directors, but it's hard to be patient with or forgiving of people who appear, appear pretty comfortable in their state of denial and get rid of staff who speak the truth about racism and inequity in their work environment. So is it a lost cause? Do we instead take Coco Fusco's word, words to heart? We need new institutions, she wrote in Hyperallergic. And she continues, while justice and equity may be goals for a democratic political culture, they have never, never been the, principal, the principles that drive the most powerful patrons and artists, and I would add museum directors of the art world. I did not become a curator because I could be happy working in an environment where I had to keep my head down in order to keep my job. Sign me up. Sign me up to start work on creating new institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Coco, Coco Fusco, would you please unmute yourself? Hi. Um, I have a PowerPoint, so I just need to share my screen. Okay, and view slideshow. Here we go. Racism is everyone's problem. I don't find it contradictory to advocate for a critical analysis of power relations in our culture and to support freedom of speech and to recognize all Americans as the inheritors of racist imagery. Philip Guston represents a significant case study for me as an artist and as a teacher, a stylistically eclectic painter whose critical mind and moral compass drew him to the thorniest social issues of his time. His drawings of Richard Nixon from the Watergate era are among my favorite examples of political satire. Giving my students the opportunity to confront and discuss his imagery is important to me and crucial for them. Frankly, I would welcome a multiplicity of exhibitions that showcase all the signage, graphics, advertisements, postcards, photographs, newsreels, paintings, and monuments that sustain white supremacy to this day. We could all benefit from such a reckoning. The history of art is replete of de uh, depictions of war, genocide, persecution, and degrading caricature? Are we going to put an indefinite hold on the visualizations of all disturbing phenomena now? It troubles me that Black people are being characterized as intolerant, unable to interpret symbolism, and instantly traumatized by the sight of a Klansman as if we were not surrounded in our daily lives with all kinds of examples of racist violence. I can't think of a more condescending way to address an audience. It also bothers me that we seem to be ignoring that Gustin was a Jew and Jews are targeted by the Ku Klux Klan. African-Americans are being treated as a monolithic entity that all think, feel and respond in one way and this erases decades of efforts by Black feminists and Black queer activists and Black progressives to articulate difference and dissent among African descended peoples of which I am one. It is one thing to unite as a community when confronted by actual acts of violence. It is quite another to presume that symbolic representations can elicit only one response from viewers. Museum leadership across the country has been startled over the past three years by protests against exhibitions, staff, and trustees. Many are in the midst of internal battles over what constitutes anti-racist transformation. While the more well-endowed institutions have the means to manage these crises, others fear that controversy will hurt them economically and politically, and thus seek to avoid unflattering media coverage. Those strategies have included throwing many curators and artists under the bus, making them take the fall for institutions that have rarely, if ever, shown any concern for social justice. Public discussions about institutional racism in the United States is fixated on public shaming of individuals, 
confusing vengeance with institutional reform. In Europe, decolonization efforts, efforts are focused on repatriation. We treat racism as a question of personal conduct rather than a hegemonic ideology. But decolonization entails addressing racism as embedded in our culture and our institutions. The postponement of the Gustin exhibition is a prime example of how museum directors and trustees make preemptive moves based on fears of controversy that they conveniently recast as a concern for communities. This begs the question of who exactly constitutes that community. During the cultural wars of the 1990s, community was invoked by social conservatives that the art world dismissed as intellectually inferior. Now that it is inconvenient for the art world establishment to admit to their longstanding indifference to anyone other than the rich and famous, museum leadership is tripping over itself to appear accommodating. I will not be fooled. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. Pablo Hilguera, Pablo, will you please um, unmute yourself? And I fear I just mangled the pronunciation of your last name. It's fine, thank you. Thank you, Lauren Helen, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I probably can add better or more insightful comments than the ones of my other colleagues, uh, but I would like to speak from the standpoint of someone who, uh, from the inside of a museum Specifically, I uh, would like to talk about the internal realities of museums in the US as they relate to dealing with exhibiting controversial art, which as I will argue is primarily an, about money. Over the last 29 years and, of, and until a few weeks ago, out of a personal choice, I worked in US museums from large to small, from the small community museum to behemoth size institutions. My role was always the very rare behind the scenes job of educator uh, in public programming, a job that consists of organizing, curating and staging conversations about art with a range of well-known and little known voices. My job was to work on, on and support the public voice of the museum. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to work in a museum, I just want you to know that museums are primarily composed of very experienced and very dedicated individuals. 99.9 uh, .9 of them non-millionaires, um, some of them people of color, although certainly never enough and not in positions of power, um, but, uh, but who in most respects uh, work as public servants. Uh, issues like the Gustin controversy we're discussing today constitute only a small fraction of the philosophical and logistical problems of museum staff, uh, including curators, educators, exhibition designers, installation staff, membership, marketing, PR, and visitor services and more confront and resolve on a daily basis. Uh, and for the most part, the success in our jobs uh, means complete invisibility, means uh, being unperceived as a seamless context onto which programming regularly unfolds. That said, this moment in particular reveals clearer than ever the imperfection of the museum model and in a broader context, the economic model of museum support, particularly in the United States. As it has been said many times, the economic and health crisis that we have faced this year exposed more than ever the systemic racial and social inequities that we have known to exist, but that we have often avoided to confront. With a white supremacist president fanning the flames of hate and division, a presidential election, the COVID crisis all burst into the open, and the art world is just one of the many stages where these debates are taking place. Now, private U.S. museums are primarily funded, as we know, by contributions of wealthy individuals, most of which derive their wealth from the very inequities that the museum is required to expose through its programming. Curators try to walk a fine line by presenting works by artists who do social and political protests without explicitly calling out individuals. Meanwhile, museum staff tries to maintain educational, the educational function of the museum by staging discussions on social and racial justice, usually by championing the works of artists who have fought those battles and made work about those topics. Focusing on the artist's work is generally the strategy instead of taking a public stance as an institution. This is because museums can take risks only insofar as it doesn't affect the financial bottom line. 
lower level staff uh, live in fear of losing their jobs and upper level staff live in fear of offending high level donors and sponsors. And it should be added that a controversy that might result in a museum losing its private support might inevitably hurt the lower level staff first, resulting in layoffs and furloughs. This is a, a sustainable, unsustainable model that satisfies nobody. Our mistake is to expect museums, at least in their current economic model that allows them to exist, to truly aspire to be progressive forums at the forefront of public discourse. My larger question is on why we continue to expect museums to exist at that forefront, knowing as we do that the larger an arts organization is, the more vulnerable it is to political and economic pressures. It is a question for those of us who want urgent social and political issues in arts to be properly addressed and supported. Is there a diverse model of funding, perhaps both public and private, that we can further explore and push for its creation that would not allow a single kind of stakeholder indirectly influence the kind of decision-making that an institution must make? This would assume, of course, the enormous but necessary task of pushing for the broadening of governmental support for the arts that would help most large museums to ease the dependence of private donors and become more accountable to the public. It might well be that an exhibition like the Gustin retrospective should not be exhibited at a, at a large historical museum, but instead in a more contemporary or even alternative context. This is because some kinds of art at some moments need to be looked not in the landscape of our history, but in the terms of their relevance to the contemporary moment. For Gustin's work, right in this moment is contemporary, not something that we can only contemplate as part of a distant past. Last phrase, its implication directly concerns us today and we cannot face those kind of works directly until we also face the institutional constraints that permit us to exhibit and engage with it in the first place. Thank you, Pablo. Steve Locke, Steve, will you please unmute yourself? Thanks, Helen, thanks, Laura. And um, thanks much to my uh, co-panelists for bringing the hot fire this morning. It's been really great to listen to you. Um, I uh, was, I've been writing about this uh, exhibition ever since the beginning of this, and I am privileged to be able to share this text with you. I'm in art school, my first year in an MFA program in 1999. I am the only black student in my painting major studio class. Our professor is showing us slides. Yes, actual slides of paintings. It's a classic art school moment, a group of young people, an older professor, flashes of light on a studio wall paintings, one after the other, that have something to do with the current lesson and have a particular interest for people in the class in terms of technique and subject. An image of a Klansman appears on the wall and I gasp. The slide seems to be up for much longer than all the other slides. It is a painting of a classic theme, the artist in the studio. Here, the artist wears the white robe of a member of the Ku Klux Klan. It is painted in a cartoony, clumsy, almost goofy style as if it were from the funny pages. Everything in the picture seems swollen. The figure holds a chubby cigar with gray smoke rising from it like a tornado. He holds a brush in his bright red hand, which is trained on a little canvas on an easel. It is clear that he's painting a self-portrait. I cannot believe my eyes. I am appalled and stunned that we are looking at this image. I cannot fathom why someone would paint this subject in this manner. Why is he showing us this, I thought. Why do I have to sit here and look at this picture of a KKK member? I hear my teacher say, Philip Gustin, 1969, the studio, about six by six feet, oil on canvas. Why are you showing us this, I ask. Everyone looks at me. The painting is the beginning of Gustin's departure from abstraction and a return to a new kind of figuration. And he was in the Klan, I ask? No, my professor says, although he uses this figure as an alter ego. He's white? Yes and Jewish. There was a lot of controversy about Gustin. You should examine it. Next slide. I scribbled down the name, an alter ego, a Jewish artist painting himself as a Klansman. I am not able to pay attention to the other artists in the slide presentation. The Gustin picture is all I can think about. I feel certain that my classmates can smell my anger. I spend the rest of that day in the school library looking at everything I can dig up on Philip Gustin. I look at all the work I can find. I learned about his trajectory, his work as a muralist, his time in the WPA, his success as an abstract painter, his struggle, his loss of confidence, his return to figuration. I read the reviews of the 1970 Marlboro Gallery show in New York, the show that included the studio. 
I read about his long teaching career. I learned about his work drawing for, cons drawing for conspirators 1930, which shows a group of Klansmen lynching a black man while a large hooded figure in the foreground slumps in what seems to be regret. Seeing that work from 39 years before he painted the studio signals to me that this imagery has been with him for a while. I learned that I am not seeing what I think I am seeing. Instead of evidence of an artist's racism, I learned that for the first time in my life, I am seeing a white artist, one of the giants of American art, grapple with his own complicity in white supremacy. I am learning that I am seeing a great abstract painter turn his back on abstraction and all that word contained in that moment to engage with his whiteness and complicity in racism. Instead of putting the Klan hood on someone else in 1969, he puts it on himself. He cloaks himself in the everyday violence and racism of the time in which he lives. It's no accident that the figure in the studio is red handed. Unlike those in Conspirators, the hooded figures in the later Gustin paintings like Edge of Town and Flatlands are not pictured engaged in mayhem. They are rather driving, smoking and hanging out together. They're doing ordinary things. And I learn, I learn from a place not of comfort or protection, but from one of challenge and analysis. I learned that my feelings about art are a catalyst for engagement, not an end in and of themselves. Right now, there is no shortage of outrage about art, paintings, and the question of who has the ability or even the right to portray particular subjects. Images can generate powerful responses. People claim that images do violence and that the public, especially the disenfranchised, should be protected from images that would harm them. I wonder how deeply people interrogate their own responses to what they see, if they go beyond what they feel to what they think. I wonder if anyone is willing to do the sometimes challenging work of learning from and engaging with artworks, particularly those we term difficult. I wonder if an artwork is an opportunity to re-examine one's selfhood. I wonder if museums are willing to educate their publics as well as their own staff to help them understand the works they present. I'm almost done. I wonder if people know that when they are talking about an artwork, they're actually talking about themselves. I really don't wonder about those things, to be honest. What I'm doing is lamenting that they are gone. Because it really has to be said that there's a specious notion that race is solely about Black people. White people have been allowed to claim that because they are white, they don't understand race, they cannot understand race, and should not ever discuss race. And if race ever comes to the fore, then white people insist black people need to be brought in as the authority and must educate white people about race. To my mind, this absolves white people of any responsibility to examine their own racial identity and allows for the persistence of the myth of white racial innocence. White people know what racism is. They know what white supremacy is. They are the organizing principles of American life. Black people don't need to explain to white people the system of, of oppression that white people created to ensure their dominance but white people often outsource their um, guilt and their pain about white supremacy to black people. So they can claim, I could never understand what it is to be black. The myth of white racial innocence is married to the lie of inscrutable blackness. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Now, um, Laura will read a statement by Dr. Kelly Morgan. Laura, if you unmute yourself, please. Hi. Wow. Okay. Um, I have the um, task to read you this, which is uh, an email that Kelly sent to us following um, following our invitation, and she's asked that it be read um, aloud. Uh, she writes, I have to admit, I haven't given this issue much attention as I immediately noticed the stark differences between the art world's response to the postponement of a retrospective versus the pin drop silences around the demands from museum workers for structural change. I often feel that the field is constantly concerned about the wrong things. And I've just lost interest in engaging in a field where some of its most powerful voices will fervently advocate for a show before advocating for the basic human rights of its workers. Shows like this require the lens of black critical race scholars and visual arts and culture. 
these issues just didn't just become a thing with the murder of George Floyd. They've always been an issue, a very deadly one that most museums, including the four institutions involved, actively perpetuate. Responsible processes of recontextualization have to start at the very beginning of a show with every museum department at the table. Most importantly, these conversations must include new voices that deeply understand the context and implications of race and white supremacy because they are two different things. And the specific functionality of each within museums, art history, and the larger visual and pictorial spheres. This then must be coupled with very specific and deliberate efforts to create the structural changes needed to support shows that attempt to grapple with race, violence, white supremacy, and its various iterations and vestiges. Most museums do not have these structures and sadly, many have no interest in building them. I just wa wa walked away from IMA because of that and hundreds of museum professionals across the country are illuminating the realities of that more and more every day. So I think this Gustin response, much like the Schutz and Durant issues, is the most recent manifestation of the larger problem. Nothing will change until the overall structure of the field and the institutions themselves change because as a critical race scholar myself, I'll tell you, race relations in this country will be even worse in 2024 than what? At some point, the field and its institutions really need to get a clue. I've always liked Gustin's work and felt that he was being critical in his depictions of the KKK. No disrespect to the curators or Gustin's family, but whatever you're whenever you're dealing with that type of imagery, because it, is very, it very literally represents the lifeblood of American culture in that racial terrorism is still very much alive and well right now, the interpretation and overall presentation of the work has to do much more than communicate artist intent and complicate the historical contexts. It has to prove analysis, provide analysis, critique, and tangible solutions. And I don't know, the show could very well do so. But when you're also dealing with institutions that clearly don't have the know-how to talk about these issues, cancellation happens and we're right back to square one. It's the built-in dilemma, which was purposefully designed to maintain white supremacy within the field as a whole. Nothing productive can happen in art museums around these issues until that hamster wheel is demolished. Thank you. Uh, Chelsea Spengman, please. Chelsea, will you please unmute yourself? Hello. Thank you, Helen and Lara, for organizing this gathering and inviting me to share my question. Thank you to all the participants for your incredibly thought-provoking comments. My name is Chelsea Spengman. For the past 10 years, I've had the privilege of working with Sarah Vanderbeek as the director of the Stan Vanderbeek Archive. In January, Sarah and I will launch an artist collective called Agency. I'm also the co-founder of AFL, a network of artist estate and foundation leaders. To be honest, the cancellation of the Gustin exhibition was not a flashpoint for me. As someone who has embraced the nuance and challenge of posthumously representing an artist body of work with an extremely limited budget and no endowment, I was not particularly worried about what happened to this exhibition. From my vantage point, it was only going to stretch the resources of four prominent museums and further uplift the value of a master painter with an extremely supported foundation and blue chip gallery representation, all at a time when so many were in need of so much. Perhaps I was too wrapped up in the pandemic fallout, witnessing living artists with no financial security struggle through this current moment, seeing many museums across the US still not reopening almost a year after closing experiencing children losing the opportunity for education, women without support being pulled from the workforce, people without health care, basic human rights being withheld from most, blatant, violent, hate-fueled attacks on black and brown bodies, never more on full display. Really, how was it that this issue, the cancellation of a monographic exhibition of a painter at four museums was the one that prompted 2000 influential people to sign a petition for change? Are we really still fighting for blockbuster solo shows? Is Gustin really for now, or even for two years, or four years from now? If you take several years to plan a show, at what point do you add to the title, 
Now, who benefits from a monographic exhibition at this stage? Should this format still dominate? Might a group show using Gustin's work to uplift other artists shed a more complex light on these works in this moment? Why are precious resources being spent over several years to produce scholarship, conservation, organization, and capital on artworks that already have plenty of everything? America's basements and attics are overflowing with radical ideas and expressions that have been excluded for too long. They are deteriorating and they will disappear. Who will offer care? Call me jealous or irreverent, what it really comes down to is this cancellation is a perfect example of the fear and avoidance museums have been forced into practicing since public funding has disappeared. This event also demonstrates the complicated reality of our cultural institution's servitude to social media. Having worked so hard to invite the public in, museums now have to contend with each body being equipped with access to hundreds of others and the ability to immediately reframe an image a museum worked so hard to fix and fixate upon. Harnessing a collective has never been easier. Reactive, protective, and afraid of the masses. The calculation is clear. Shock the art world elite and Gustin acolytes, or risk the possibility of an image of a hooded Klansman being removed from its academic context and let loose on social media, with it all traceable back to your institution. I would also choose the former. An interest in the layers of the collective in this issue are ultimately what drove me to reflect on the cancellation and ensuing response. The power of the collective, seen this past year harnessed in social uprisings on the left and right, as needed for pandemic control, as used to out and cancel abusers, with the potential to make someone a millionaire overnight, as we are told is necessary for democracy. And in our small art world, determining what museums show, being the reason for this event, and hopefully affecting the overhaul of institutional museum practice that is long overdue. Collective power at its best drives progress. The alternative of singling one man out, of continuing to uplift individuals via a painting show or even the farce of a presidential election yields the pathetic figures we by now all recognize in Gustin's hooded cartoons themselves. Alone, separated from a group, cloaked in whiteness, they are powerless. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chelsea. And next up is Terrence Washington. Terrence, can you please unmute yourself? I think I'm good. Um, Terrence Washington, working in New Haven, Connecticut. A mere 18 months and three days ago, a group of seventh graders was harassed at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. The museum investigated the students' claims that a museum security staff member had told them that no watermelon was allowed in the museum, finding that the member had more likely said no water bottles. It was always important to me that, even if it didn't actually happen, the students thought they heard watermelon. That is, they were primed to hear a racist comment by the environment and all the evidence of their lives before that trip. Whether or not we share their experience has no bearing on its truth for them. I think of that incident now because the MFA Boston is now the opening venue for the Gustin Now exhibition. Those who argue that the exhibition should never have been postponed should also be prepared to argue that the MFA would have been ready to show even cartoonish images of Klansmen, possibly to young people like these who already fear and have experienced the museum as harboring racists. This isn't to say it could never happen, but that it takes work to get there, work the MFA says it has begun. I'm told by defenders of keeping the Gustin exhibition's original date that much work has been done to contextualize the Klan images. My question is to what degree was that work done for the sake of the exhibition, or for the sake of Philip Gustin's legacy? How seriously then can this work be taken as indicative of real change beyond the scope of the exhibition and what work should be done to prevent this episode from happening again? Separately, it feels to me like a failure of the media or certainly of art and institutional critique that the very terms of discussion about the Gustin decision have been set by people who disagree with it and are invested personally and financially in the original opening date remaining the same. This while presenting bad faith characterizations of the reasoning behind the decision. And still, 
not in press releases, nor Instagram posts, nor countless articles in the art press, nor even now in this very forum, have the opinions of non-art world people been solicited or represented. Visitor, visitors are often sacrificed to the discursive process by which museums serve as sites for exhibitions, which need to happen to validate an artist's importance. Once the exhibition happens, visitors are rarely or never mentioned again, unless something bad happens. It's as if exhibitions happen to people. Exhibitions serve objects. The general public that these exhibitions purport to serve does not exist and never did. We conjure them up to bear whatever traits we project upon them for the sake of our arguments. And it doesn't seem that this controversy has moved us to engage with the museum's various publics. We have retreated to our corners, still claiming to speak for them, never having listened. The conversation about complicity with white supremacy that could be started by this exhibition is actually, as many of us know, already happening. We have decided, I suppose, that this conversation about race should happen this way through this exhibition. How did we decide this? How else is this conversation happening? It strikes me that a conversation that is forced, uh, which is a phrase that has been used, is not at all a conversation. How do we determine, except by convention, that this conversation should happen in this form? And if the conversation is the thing, then by what other means is it happening? Um, finally, I'm not worried about protests. Focusing on the extreme case of a potential protest leaves us yet again inattentive to a quieter phenomenon. For every protester, a few potential visitors will never know, decide they won't ever go to a museum again, or they'll find their skepticism of museums justified. We should be asking where those Boston young people, now ninth graders, are now. Our museums, much like our country, are governed by the minority and by a plutocracy. If we're not about changing that, then what are we even doing? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd say I was speechless, but my head is filled with words. <laughs> um, but I, let me just begin by thanking everyone for um, bringing such um, clarity to their own positions. It's deeply appreciated. Uh, mine and Laura's hope for this event was that it would be a palimpsest. Uh, many positions laid down um, one after the other. Uh, and we hope now in the time remaining to us to continue that by opening the floor to anyone who would like a five minute or less, as Laura said, uh, speaking uh, slot in order to say what they think, ask questions. Um, our participants, the folks who spoke to you today will not be addressing questions per se. I'm in this more as ask questions in the sort of general uh, mode. Um, it looks like we already have the first person who has volunteered. Would Ashley Drennan, um, and this is what you do, you wave your hand um, or use the hand function in the Zoom or pop your name into the chat and Joanna will gather names and put them into an order. So right now, if Ashley Drennan would please um, unmute his or her uh, uh, square, that would be great, Ashley. And perhaps maybe Joanna, yeah. maybe Ashley's got to be unmuted. I, I'm trying. Um, there you go. I have only Ashley James. Oh, okay. Is there an Ashley Drennan who has volunteered? No? Hmm. I don't want to call you out, Ashley James, but if you feel like talking, now's your moment. <laughs> um, anyone else? Anthony Drennan? Anthony? That Ashley is no longer in the room we're hearing in the chat. Okay. Would anyone else like to um, take this moment to speak publicly? I think. Uh... 
I think we had somebody else, uh, and I, I apologize, apologies for my pronunciation, but Orangutan Smith? Are you still here and would you like to say something? And then the other person we have is Adrian Umansky. Sorry, if everyone could, who wants to volunteer to speak, please put your names in the chat. That's what I'm counting on for spelling of your name to unmute you. Thank you. So Adrian Umansky, are you able to unmute yourself or is Joanna able to unmute you? Bear with us, we'll figure it all out. Yeah, Joanna's trying. <laughs> Adrian Umansky. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I am a volunteer at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. I've been a visitor there for 48 years. And I just want to point out that Kaywin Feldman is the best thing that has ever happened to the gallery. Um, when I learned about this exhibit, I started thinking about how I would feel as big bit about the Holocaust, I would have walked right out and stop volunteering. Uh, one thing that Kaywin has done in the last year with both the staff and volunteers. Adrian, and unfortunately, I'm we're going to have the final uh, analysis in about. I think her connection was bad and we've lost her. I had a hard time hearing her. I don't know if other people had that. Oh, idea. absolutely. Is there oh. maybe another volunteer? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Come on, y'all. <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to speak. We can. Um, well, we I know you're thinking stuff. We know you're thinking stuff. If you want to just share it, it doesn't have to be as prepared and beautifully said as everybody else. Oh, Todd Florio would like to speak. And there so we go. great. And then also we do have Aranjitan Smith would like to speak, but is muted. Sandra Stark, Todd Florio. Okay, so we're gonna um we're gonna go we're gonna get a list working now. And also I see in the chat a, me a message from Cindy Bernard and I do second it. If your sound is funky, if you turn off your um your uh, video, you get a better connection. But let's start now with Todd Florio, please. Todd, you should be on. Hello, Todd. Todd? Todd is unmuted. I sense a right wing conspiracy to, uh, <laughs> uh, at play here in which name there's clearly a Russian troll in our midst. Um, Todd, you're unmuted. Up. Maybe Todd doesn't want to speak. How about if we do, um, again, I'm really sorry if I'm butchering the name, the pronunciation of this person's name, Orange Houtan Smith. Okay, I've asked. There you oh, go. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, my name is Orangutan. I am apprentice in the Harrison Studio in Santa Cruz, California, and I'm an artist, a recent graduate of the UC Davis Art Studio Program. Um, we're talking about things that are said and not said, uh, things that are canceled and not canceled. Um, there is an exhibition titled Barring Freedom that's held at the San Jose Museum of Art that was not canceled and was conceptualized before the current crisis of COVID-19 and the recent brutal onslaught of police killings of Black people in the United States. A series of Zoom con uh, discussions underpins the force of this exhibition, uh, and it began with Angela Davis and Professor Gina Dent. Uh, Davis reflected, 
When we are told that we simply need better police and better pr prisons, we counter with what we really need. We need to be able to reimagine security, which will involve the abolition, abolition of policing and imprisonment as we know them and reinvent entire worlds. Um, the artists included in this exhibition, uh, are among them are Sanford Biggers, Sonia Clark, and Dred Scott, among others. Uh, the exhibition runs through Sunday, March 21st in 2021, and uh, Barring Freedom is organized by the UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences and San Jose Museum of Art. I am not affiliated with either institution. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we have another volunteer, Sandra Stark. Sandra? Hi. Um... I recently retired from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts after 40 years, uh, and I'm an artist, obviously. But I just had a quick question. If the curators from the museums were invited to not participate, but to just sit in to listen to what everybody was saying today, I mean, they would get a tremendous education, or, or were they just kind of set aside, or was there outreach to them? I'm, just curious. They were absolutely invited to participate if they wished. Um, you know, I think from my and Helen's perspective, it would put them in a very awkward position to be necessarily responsive. So they've all been apprised of it. We, we talked about in the beginning, the, the different facts of the current situation and we also communicated with them about that so yeah they were definitely apprised of the details of this event maybe you could send this to them i, I think a bunch of them are on but <laughs> oh good that's ex thank you okay. is there anyone else who would like to um participate in the conversation Um, Todd, do you want to speak? Todd Florio just sent uh, something in the chat. So and it looks like he then just said, sure. So Todd, if you would like to speak, that'd be great. If you can unmute yourself. It looks like Todd Florio and then Hannah Heller, please. Todd, you are unmuted. Todd, are you having trouble unmuting yourself? Well, he is unmuted, but I think he's... Okay, so I'll just read Todd's comment. Um, I mostly wanted to say thank you and express my delight at seeing so many thoughtful people I know from New York City, art world from which I defected. Maybe that's a bad word choice. I want to remind everyone that the board of trustees is in charge of hiring and firing the museum director and many decisions that seem to be made by the director, the result of intense practice. And Hannah Heller. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm very nervous. Um, I only want to offer my perspective as a museum educator who aspires to develop anti-racist orientations for all my students. And I feel like, um, I think Steve Locke's comments speak to me the most um, from that perspective uh, that I feel like I'm only doing half the work if I am teaching from um, very, excellent and powerful counter narratives by artists of color. I think we also need those works here and there, um, not necessarily by white artists, but by, by artists who are, um, yes, centering whiteness, but so that we can critically treat it so that we can name it and subvert it. Um, that there's um, two sides to that anti-racism coin from an educational perspective. And, um, and thank you all so much for everyone for speaking today. I think this is a really complicated conversation with um, possibly no uh, answers, but lots of really good questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It looks like we have a volunteer in Jenny Taylor. Jenny? Jenny Taylor.
Do we have any luck with Jenny Taylor? She's unmuted. Hi, Hi I'm hey. here. Um, hello, everyone. I am here from Dublin, Ireland. I work in the National Gallery of Ireland in the Education Department. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing everyone's views. Um, I would like to put a question to each of the panelists with a choice of one word answer, uh, like one word or the other, if everyone is, is prepared to just give a one word answer to this question. Um, I am trying to have a grasp on how to even go about making change in museums and po making positive change. So when we talk about museums specifically, I would like to hear what is your view on how to start actually making change? Would you use the word rebuild or repair? Thank you. I feel bad because we promised everyone that they wouldn't have to answer any questions. And so um, I think I'm gonna stick to that and uh, see if Mari Carmen Barrio Giardano, oh my God, it's terrible today on the last names, but Mari Carmen, um, if you could get unmuted, that would be great. And I think if anyone feels like answering the question, they can just pop it into the chat. That's such a good diplomatic response, Laura, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, and Helen, I understand. <laughs> Um, so Dono, <laughs> pizza in, in Chicago. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who spoke also. And I also, like Hannah, feel kind of really um, uh, nervous to speak, which is funny because I'm just talking to my laptop. But um, uh, I wanted to say I, I am former staff of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in the interpretation team. Um, and I think that um, what Paolo was speaking of earlier about, you know, institutional issues is, is so true. Um, uh, not, I mean, there are many levels, of course, there are a lot of issues with sort of uh, the, the direct, direction uh, and the director's office in museums, but there are also, um, you know, deep issues of hierarchy within museums. And those hierarchies often are um, presented as issues of communication um, across um, uh, sort of levels of staff within a museum. Um, I agree with Pablo that there are educators and um, there is capacity. I think there is institutional capacity in many museums um, to be able to uh, speak or even if, and if there is not, there is institutional will uh, on behalf of many staff members to want to be able to do uh, the, the things and to um, speak and uh, I would say to take on the challenges that a show like this one presents. Um, I think, however, that there is, uh, th there are these issues of communication and of knowledge really on behalf of uh, directors and on behalf of higher ups about what their staff can actually do, uh, what their staff can actually take on. Um, and there are these asymmetries that I think are, um, are deep <laughs> and um, cause much of this um, brouhaha, I think. Um, so I think one of the things that I would, one of the calls that I would put out to directors and to uh, higher ups within museums, curators, people who have sort of big power, um, I think it would be, you know, to talk to your staff and get to know, get to know the things that your staff can actually do. And by staff, I don't mean head curators, I mean, you know, interpretive planners like I was or, um, or uh, members of the, um, of the uh, frontline staff. Um, many of us have skills and interests and the will to take on these challenges. Um, and it's important to be able to recognize that, recognize the abilities in the, the staff that you already have um, that I feel, I feel often is not because of the sort of asymmetry in communication. That's it. Thank you very much. And this was lovely and so informative and I'm very glad to have been part of this conversation. Thank you very much, Mari Carmen. I appreciate that. It looks like we have another um, uh, person who'd like to speak, Sarah Kleinman. 
Sarah, if you can unmute yourself or we can get you unmuted, that'd be mm -hmm. fantastic. Yes. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone, and um, good afternoon or good day wherever you are at. Um, my name is Sarah Kleinman. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I joined this conversation um, sort of on, with one foot in academia and the other foot in the museum world. I'm currently writing my dissertation on Kinnist and McShine. Um, I've been working on this project since May 2016. Um, and throughout this journey of discovering who McShine was, um, he was fiercely private and he refused to participate in the, um, the publication of curatorial studies literature in the late 80s and 90s. But throughout this and culminating up, especially in the past year, um, it's become so apparent um, within the academy just how ingrained the narratives are um, away from representing voices that have been historically underrepresented. I actually had to um, push against my dissertation, my um, previous dissertation advisor to even start this topic. Um, I was informed that no one writes about curators and no one writes about Kinnist and McShine. Um, I brought this to my dissertation or to my program chair, showed her my research and also um, in conversation with a few other formative people, um, including Hans Hacke, whose um, Germania installation I wrote about for my master's thesis. I decided to pursue looking at Kinnist and McShine. Um, and through this, I realized that discussions of blackness in America, um, we run the risk of essentializing identity. And this really came to the fore during my Fulbright. Um, I lived in Trinidad and Tobago where McShine was born and educated and raised. Um, I resided there from August, 2018 to 19. And so now as I'm wading through this and with Black Lives Matter um, and also, as a professor, I teach modern and contemporary art too um, for VCU arts and up and coming artists in the School of the Arts. Um, I'm grappling with how we bring identities and voices into conversations at the very, at, at, um, the level of teaching our up and coming artists. And I think that I mean, I don't have answers. It's like, it's sort of, I just wanted to participate in this conversation um, because to lump somebody like Mick Shine in with the idea of um, African-American or blackness in America is to severely undercut who he, his own identity. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. And then also some of the remarks that um, Coco Fusco you brought up about how um, certain curators are sidelined after making certain decisions. This came up in my very first conversation with Hans Hacke about how McShine was sidelined after information. And um, he had to stay in his lane, both with selecting the types of art to be shown and also with the types of exhibitions he was organizing. So these are ongoing things. I mean, this is um, nothing new, history is repeating. Um, and then also I'm realizing that the frameworks and discussions, how we're discussing blackness um, and how we bring this into the museum, the vocabularies have not yet been established to do this. And so I'm hoping with this project and more conversations, we can develop ways to discuss people like McShine, who are so formative to museum practice and, and to curating today. Um, and then to answer the question about repairing or rebuilding, um, I don't think rebuilding is necessarily the right way because that implies that we are deconstructing something and replacing it anew when we have a responsibility to remember the histories that um, 
we need to repair. So that's my answer for that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And next up would be Ashley James, please. Ashley. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all. I wanted to especially thank Nikki and Terrence, whose um, five minute speeches I particularly enjoyed and hit home. Um, I just want to reiterate something that Terrence, I think, um, was the thrust of Terrence's um, note which is that so much of this is about audience and um, it strikes me that coming out of this conversation and the Gustin conversation more broadly, it seems like this event has really clarified two strands, two, sep two parallel but intersecting strands as it pertains to racial justice, anti-racism. On the one hand, it's the question of representation and this fact of resources. What does it mean to be spending money, time um, to a white artist over and above so many um, uh, black artists, people of color, um, some of whom consider politics, some of, and, and those people who do, con who have considered politics often are not the ones that find space in the museum. So there seems to be this kind of way that politics only becomes interesting when it, it arises at, not interesting, but legible when it rises at the site of the white male painter, um, as opposed to the usual um, kind of um, position that uh, museums take as a space where politics lives outside. But that's a side note. Um, so there's representation and the, on the other end is this question of visual culture. And what we're really seeing with Gustin, what we saw with Dana Schutz, what we see, what we saw with Kara Walker time and time again is that these images are not just an art historical question but they're a visual culture question. And we keep kind of slamming up against that at the side of the museum. So when I think about Terrence's prompts to think about the young people who come to the museum, it's when a larger context of image making um, that they see every image at the museum. So when I think about that young person showing up, I think they want to see artists that that look like them. They want to know that artists um, that they can have a space in the museum, um, but they're also looking at the actual visual language that's presented to them and and really grappling with what it, um, what it, how it relates to their life on a level that goes beyond art historical content. Um, so yeah, I wanna return us to the space of reception because part of what I um, see in this is that Gustin's own um, clan paintings are important because of postmodernism and it's also postmodernism that tells us that reception is not something that we can account for. So at some point we're gonna have to deal with the fact that audiences are not always gonna see it in the way that we interpret it or somebody else interprets it. And maybe that leads to really sticky questions like what do we put on display and when? And it's not censorship. That is the question of reception and visual culture. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Mel Harper. I work in education at the National Gallery of Art. Um, I'd like to build on some of the things that Ashley was sharing. I think that sometimes a failure is just a failure. And for people who work outside of large institutions, there can be this thought that any mistake or failure was an intentional strategic choice and that institutions are capable of doing better and they just choose not to, um, sometimes that's true. But if we want this radical change to happen within institutions, what do we think that that's going to look like? Rushing through something that should be thoughtful and nuanced to meet a, a specific deadline? That's that's not always the right solution. I, I think there's a lot of messy work that needs to be done. We all know that. Right now we're doing it via Zoom. That lacks heart. It lacks nuance. And to build on what Terrence was saying, so much of the media coverage surrounding this kind of just fomented up this churn of outrage 
and different straw man fallacies were being ascribed to the postponement and people would rail against that straw man. And is that even what is going on? I think when, I think when we're feeling outrage about the Gustin postponement, because you know, even within the staff, there's been outrage. And as we saw at the tape, you know, the institutions aren't a monolith either. People are feeling different feelings, and, and some of those are outrage even from inside. But when we're feeling that outrage, I think we need to identify what am I actually responding to? And is the outrage that I feel really caused by this postponement? Or is it something larger? And how do we turn that outrage against that actual enemy, which is in this case, white supremacy and white dominant culture in museums? Is railing against the Gustin postponement really railing against white supremacy and white dominant culture in museums? I'm not sure. I, I guess that's all I have to say, but I, I'll say um, I've also noticed this big, every conversation about this lumps you into one of two camps. Like you're either team woke or team snob. Like, no, I want things to stay like they are. Or no, I want everyone to do DEAI work and, um, and, and have safe spaces and, and cry white guilt tears. Um, that not everyone falls into those two camps and not every opinion can be automatically shifted one way or the other. We have to exist in the gray space. And that's what's been so exciting about this conversation. And, and thank you so much for hosting it. I've been trying to, as I listen to everyone's statements, resist categorizing people one way or the other as I listen. And I think that's what we do. You know, you as we listen, we listen for those markers of are you team woke or are you team snob? And then you hear the rest of the comments through that lens. And I, I think to really make change and really be able to host the Gustin show in a way that honors the work of Gustin, which is very nuanced, unlike the, the outrage conversations, that's what we'll have to do. I hope that we will be able to host the show as robustly as everyone expected it last year and then again in 2021. Um, but if we're able to do so, we'll have to leave room for nuance because people just digging their heels in and getting more and more outraged is going to cause um, those who we need to come together around the show to either like cancel it in their minds or um, protest it and or try to shut it down or want it to happen. We can't feel entitled to the show happening the way that we want it to happen. Um, Museums are always going to be contested spaces. I'm, I'm borrowing that language from Kaywin. And we, this type of wrestling is okay. What we can't do is stop talking and just labeling everyone one way or the other and, and not coming to a larger solution. Um, thank you for the space to speak. Thank you so much, Mel. I think. Um... I don't know, I don't think I could have summed up my feelings of that today any better than you just did. Um, I just, I wanna say, I wanna contribute one last parting thought and maybe Helen would like to too, but I, you know, in coming to the end of my work on this book that I hope will be helpful in these conversations, in these convers types of conversations going forward, um, I really see, um, protest and the demands that are being made of institutions right now as forms of radical care. And I hope that um, conversations like this can kind of provide a space to actually see how that can work, um, whether it's for repair or redoing or undoing or remaking or completely destroying and rebuilding. Um, I don't know how to define any of those things, but I do know that it's our collective work to do together. Um, and I think for me, today's discussion was really um, a desire to um, collect a lot of what you all are thinking right now, um, because I know that I don't have the answers and I only represent a few set of life experiences bundled into a human body. So I just wanna say thank you. And thank you to Helen for really, for being an amazing partner in, 
in, in organizing this and kind of thinking it through. So thank you all. It's been amazing. Thank you to Laura. And let me just um, add my enormous gratitude to everyone who spoke and everyone who came to listen. Um, this has been a, a very bracing morning. Um, listening to all of you, I found um, myself uh, in the tide of each of you, um, with you as your arguments were being made. Um, and so this effect of a palimpsest of many different ideas hitting the table um, and not having to choose as Mel so rightly defined us in between team snob and team woke, but rather occupying the particular complex position of team snob, team woke, team tired, team radical, team fed up, team in love with every art museum I ever walked into, team I got a pack of matches and some kerosene in my bag. All of those teams, I'm on all of those teams. And I guess I'll end in part by um, re-paraphrasing or, or calling out something that Steve Locke said when he said, do we understand that when we talk about works of art, we are actually talking about ourselves? That really moves me to my core. And it's, it's why I believe in talking about art because I'm actually searching for the most complex way I can possibly muster for trying to understand myself in the world. And so today has been um, a small success in that uh, regard and I stand with you in the struggle and hope to lend um, my elbow grease and my ambivalence uh, to the struggle in every way and so um, we will meet again hopefully in person thank you thank you all very much thank you thank you bye-bye